activity in a changing climate, improve soil health and restoration, bioremediation, improve food quality, um, develop functional foods, and also new inoculants and enzymes for the industry. And we know that we must foster citizen engagement and awareness raising on this very, very important issue, which could op open many opportunities. Uh, before I conclude, I'd like to just mention some key milestones and next steps. Uh, perhaps you're aware that we very recently launched our uh, special 1 billion euro Green Deal call, uh, within which uh, there is a dedicated farm to fork topic and there the submission date is uh, end of January. So we look forward to some uh, very interesting, uh, compelling proposals being submitted uh, by that deadline. We recently had our RNI Days uh, virtual event where we had a session on post-COVID food systems, building a post-COVID food systems economy. If you haven't seen that, uh, that session, it was a very exciting session. Um, I invite you to, uh, to uh, go online. It's still uh, going to be made available online on the platform for another couple of weeks. Uh, we have the Farm to Fork conference coming up on the 15th and 16th of October. This is a conference being organized by my colleagues in DG Santé and DG Agri. And, uh, and in piggyback to this conference, we have our uh, annual World Food Day Food 2030 high level event under the German presidency in collaboration with FAO. That's going to be on the second half of the day uh, on 16th of October. So it's a lunchtime event. So please uh, make sure you bring your sandwiches. Um, it, take, it starts at 12.15 all the way to approximately 2.30. So we, I really invite you to register and join us for that day. Um, then we have the Fit for Food 2030 final conference coming up in November. We have the EIT Food Conference coming up in early December. Then the SCAR Foresight Conference and the launch of their uh, fifth foresight report within which there is uh, much emphasis on transforming food systems that will take place on 14th to 16th December. And then finally, I mentioned uh, the calls for proposals for Horizon Europe, which will launch in early 2021. And all of these are milestones to get us um, to get us ready for the UN World Food Systems Summit that will take place in 2021. So we have a busy, busy uh, schedule ahead of us, and I hope that you'll join us for, for our various events. Uh, I'd like to thank you for, for your attention, and I'm happy to uh, try and answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Philip, over to you. If you're on mute, Philip? Philip, I can't hear you. You're on mute. <laughs> okay, can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, I was thanking you for that excellent introduction to the symposium and saying that it really fits well with the new ILC Europe um, activity around sustainability. So I think ILC Europe would very much look to be uh, look forward to being part of some of these consortia that might develop. So I think we have time for one question, Karen, which is um, the influence of the COVID-19 pandemic on, on our Horizon Europe research program and whether there might be some prioritization of particular uh, topics or pathways in the light of the pandemic? Um, the um, the influence of, of COVID on Horizon Europe, um, it's, it's uh, we're still very much building up Horizon Europe, so it, it's hard to say to what extent um, uh, what we will eventually roll out will be influenced by by uh, by COVID. Um, of, of course, the the, uh, the the crisis has made it clear that our food systems um, are, are are at the heart and center uh, of uh, of how we can come out of this uh, better. Um, we have the, the the EU has launched its recovery package, next generation EU, uh, with uh, as a means to to yeah uh, restart or kickstart the economy after uh, following COVID. So this, of course, has had an impact on on all our our our, our budgeting. Um, 
what else to say? I, I think um, the, the notion of resilience, of food system resilience, which perhaps was not as um, highlighted before COVID, has now really come to the forefront. So how can we ensure that our food systems are, are resilient? Um, so I think that will probably, we will see more of this aspect within the context of, of Horizon Europe uh, in relation to, to our food systems work. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, it's early days, I think, so this will evolve. So I think, um, Karen, thanks again. I think we need to stop here and I'll hand over to Oliver Hasselwanda to chair the session on proteins, which will continue in the site where we are now. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye bye. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Philip. Um, I hope you can hear me all okay. Um, yeah, my name is um, Oliver Hasselwander, and I would like to welcome you to this uh, first session. I work for DuPont Nutrition and Biosciences, and at ILSE Europe, I'm a member of the Scientific Advisory Committee, and I chair the Health Benefit of Foods um, Task Force. And I have the a pleasure to moderate this first session, um, which is called The Role of Proteins in a Healthy and Sustainable Diet. And just before we get started, I would like to briefly explain. We'll have um, two 10-minute talks, followed by a shorter talk by ILSI. And then we have a more extended Q&A session at the end. And in terms of asking questions, just to remind you on the left, there is a, a little icon with a question mark, and that's the one to ask questions. And um, maybe you can type in also the name of the person you are addressing with that question. Okay, so uh, regarding the session, this uh, I think the keynote by Dr. Fabri was really a perfect introduction to this session. It highlighted where the EU has the research and innovation agenda. And we've seen there is a priority around nutrition for sustainable and healthy diets, including topics around alternative protein and dietary shifts. And we know that these um, shifts will be challenging. And um, for example, the Eat Lancet Commission has, has highlighted that it is possible and it indeed necessary to feed 10 billion people by 2050, but it can be done within the safe uh, planetary boundaries of the food production, as they call it. But we need to act now. And so we've, we've chosen, obviously, the, the macronutrient protein to focus on um, for two reasons. Obviously, it's a, it's a key um, nutrient for growth and development and body function. But of course, it's also the, the biggest lever to move towards a more sustainable diet by shifting from meat consumption to more plant-based sources. So we will start the session um, with hearing about protein requirements and quality in relation to age and lifestyle, as well as uh, the shift to plant-based proteins. Then we will hear about how these more sustainable, but sometimes novel proteins uh, can be brought to the consumer in a, in a safe way, which requires really understanding their digestibility and allergenicity profiles. And then at the end, we will hear about ILSI's activities in, in this sector, uh, specifically about the start of the new task force. And then we'll have the Q&A session. So I would like to welcome now um, Professor Daniel Tomé. Um, he's a professor at Acro Paris Tech in France, and he is a director at the Research Unit for Nutritional Physiology and Eating Behavior. And he is a leading expert in relation to protein requirements and quality. And Professor Tomé's talk is entitled a shift towards plant-based diets, can optimum protein intake be maintained in all age groups? Professor Tome, please. Can you hear me? Hi. Okay, so uh, thank you, Oliver. Uh, so I will comment on this problem of uh, uh, shifting to our plant-based diet and particularly the, the quality of uh, Food proteins and from animal and plant source. So this is my declaration of interest. So uh, proteins uh, are used to produce amino acids, to provide amino acids, which are used for protein synthesis that support important function in the body, maintenance of body composition, 
protein deposition protocol, many metabolic process, uh, many physiological function, defense, and uh, health property in, in, in the body. So there is a need to provide an adequate quantity of protein to balance nitrogen losses and to support protein synthesis. But the function of the amino acid is achieved only it at the same time of the total quantity of protein. The nine indispensable amino acids, which are not synthesized in the body, are also provided. So this is a problem of protein quantity, but also of protein quality. What is the uh, total requirement for protein? For adults, it has been determined from nitrogen balance, and the mean requirement is 0.66 grams of protein by kilo body weight uh, and by day. So for adults, for adults, there is only a maintenance requirement. And for uh, infant and children, there is a growth component that is added to the maintenance requirement. And so we have a value of 0.86 gram of protein by kilo body weight for uh, children. And for young infants, it's even above uh, about 1.5 gram of protein by kilo body weight uh, and by day. And as you can see, so the requirement report related to body weight is higher for uh, children and infants compared to adults. There is other condition where the protein requirement can be even above, and for instance, uh, after uh, stunting during the recovery phase uh, for catch-up growth, you see that the protein requirement is close to 3 grams uh, of protein by kilo body weight. And, uh, by, so it is a very important component in the diet. And so not only the quantity, but also the quality of important is important for the requirement. And so uh, associated to this requirement for protein, there is a requirement for indispensable amino acid, and we have defined uh, indispensable amino acid reference pattern that describe the amino acid composition of a protein, which, when provided at the level of a pro protein requirement, also, also provide an adequate quantity of each of the nine indispensable amino acids, for instance. That means that uh, for uh, children uh, from one to three years, the protein requirement is 0.86, but this quantity of protein must also contain at least, for instance, 50, 52 uh, milligrams of, uh, of lysine by gram of this protein. And so we can compare the amino acid pattern of food and diet and evaluate whether or not they can, when they are provided at the level of protein requirement, they also provide an adequate quantity of each of the indispensable amino acid patterns. But not only uh, the total quantity of protein and amino acid should be provided, but they have to be provided in a bioavailable form. Uh, the bioavailability is usually associated to digestibility because it is the limiting uh, step in protein assimilation. And so, that means that protein and, and the nine indispensable amino acids have to be provided in a bioavailable form. So digestibility is also an important issue in uh, protein requirement and protein quality. So there is different protein quality and protein requirement in different age. And so if we look at the sum uh, of the requirement for the nine amino acids, as you can see uh, here, the total requirement and the total, the total quantity of indispensable amino acid in protein provided to the different age are different, and it is lower uh, for adults compared to children and infants. And as you can see, for instance, for, the, for infant, the quantity uh, of uh, indispensable amino acid in the protein represents close to 50% of the amino acid, whereas for uh, adult, it's between it, it, uh, about 27%. Uh, uh, so close to two times more, in, more amino acid, indispensable amino acid for, uh, for infant. And as you can see here, so this is the level of total amino acid requirement that has to be provided uh, from the protein. This is for infant, for children. And for adults. And if we look at the content in indispensable amino acid in vegetable and animal protein source, 
as you can see, for adults, it seems that all the protein sources are very close, except some uh, to uh, provide adequate quantity. In contrast, for infants and uh, even for uh, children, with an exclusive uh, source of uh, vegetable protein, we can suspect that some deficiency could appear. And it is not the case, as you can see, uh, for uh, animal protein. And so, not only uh, the amino acid content is important, but also their bioavailability. And as we usually know, uh, digestibility of protein and amino acid from plant protein is most often lower than for animal protein, uh, from 70 to 90 percent in, in comparison to 90 to 100 percent. And the difference is more important when plant protein are consumed in the form of complex flour or whole grain. And you can see the different values that are in the bibliography for the digestibility of the different uh, protein, and this is the animal and the vegetable protein source. And so protein digestibility matters. And we have, for instance, some results showing that if we look at the percent risk of protein inadequacy uh, in different populations calculated from total protein or digestible protein, as you can see from total protein, so the lower curve, uh, it can go from 10 to 20 percent risk of deficiency for some uh, population. But if we consider the digestible protein, it's two times uh, above, and it can go uh, above 30% risk uh, in some of the population. And so that means that pro we have to consider not only the protein and amino acid content in the diet, but also the protein uh, availability and amino acid availability or digestibility. And so the protein quality of the different source is usually evaluated by the uh, chemical score approach, that relate the content of each indispensable amino acid in food to the reference amino acid pattern. So we compare the amino acid content uh, of food and, and diet to the reference amino acid pattern, and we correct by the digestibility. And so uh, here we have the amino acid composition, for instance, of soy and rice. We are interested no, not by the total content, but by the digestible content, each of these values is corrected by the digestibility of the protein. And so, for instance, we see that the content of digestible lysine in soy protein is 55 milligrams uh, of digestible lysine by gram of soy protein. And so we compare this value to the reference amino acid pattern. As we can see, for instance, here, uh, for digestible lysine in soy, it is above the value for lysine in the reference amino acid pattern for adults and even uh, for children. And so we can consider that lysine is not limited. In contrast, if we look uh, at the uh, sulfur amino acid in soy, they are exactly have the same value uh, than in the reference amino acid pattern for adults. So if there is some, for instance, technological treatment that reduce the content of sulfur, then it can be limiting. And even for uh, ch children in this case, you see that the value for soy is below. That means that sulfur amino acid is known, uh, is limiting in soy. And for instance, for uh, rice, we see that lysine is very low in rice, and this value is always below the value of the reference amino acid pattern for adults and for, uh, and for children. So that means that uh, lysine is limiting in rice. And if we make a mixture 50%, uh, 50% of soy and rice protein, this is the value that is obtained, and it remains below the value in the reference amino acid pattern for adult and children. That means that even with this mixture, uh, the quality uh, lysine remains a limiting factor in this amino acid. It is what is explained. This is the, 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 the protein digestibility chemical amino acid score. Uh, so we met the, the, the ratio between the bioavailable level of each amino acid in the diet uh, and the same amino acid in the reference pattern. 
as you can see, for sulfur amino acid, it's 100% can say uh, for soil. It's limiting uh, for adult and it's limiting for uh, children. For rice, lysine is limiting for adult and children. And even if we look here, with a mixture of 50% for soy and rice protein, we see uh, for uh, both adult and children, uh, lysine remain limiting. It's not very limiting, 0.8 is not very limiting, but it remains limiting. That means that even when we have a mixture of plant protein, in some case, we cannot reach a 100% uh, protein quality. So it, it can be a problem with a complete, uh, with a diet uh, using only uh, plant protein source. We have to really to, to take care. Okay, so in conclusion, the main criteria for protein quality is the capacity to provide bioavailable indispensable amino acids for both indispensable amino acid profile and bioavailability. Vegetable protein are of lower quality than animal protein. There are differences in indispensable amino acid reference profile leading to difference in protein quality according to age. Mixing different vegetable protein with different amino acid profile can partially compensate amino acid deficiency of plant-based diet, but maintaining optimal protein when shifting toward plant-based diet requires to carefully evaluate not only total protein content, but also bioavailable amino acid pattern in the diet in comparison to the reference amino acid pattern. This is particularly sensitive for younger subjects with higher protein and indispensable amino acid requirement. That means with they, 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 they need higher protein quality. And so this slide from FAO shows that protein quality matter, it is a comparison between the prevalence of stunting among children under five years and the contribution of cereal, roots, and tuber relative to total cal calorie intake. The protein are mainly coming from cereal. And as you can see, as the source of lower quality are increased in the diet, so uh, the, the prevalence of, of stunting is increased. So in countries where cereal and our roots and tuber are the most important source of calorie, stunting rates are higher. And so diversity of protein source is very important. And so it really shows that protein quality matter and we have to take care of the combination of the different protein sources. Thank you. Okay. Um, well, thank you very much, um, Professor Tome, um, for the overview, for highlighting the, the importance of uh, digestibility and bioavailability of protein and indispensable amino acids. I will um, just have a look. Uh, just remind everyone, you can type in your questions also during um, the presentations. And I see a few coming. We'll, we'll take, um, we can take one question here, maybe now. I'll try and Cue it for live answers. Um, so let's start with this one here. Um, can the occurrence of other compounds ingredients increase the digestibility, bioavailability of protein and amino acids? Uh, there is no clear association with other components, but we know, for instance, first, uh, usually isolate protein. So for animal protein, usually the, the, the digestibility is relatively high, huh? uh, both for, for milk and soy uh, and, and, and meat. Uh, uh, we, we evaluate and there's a lot of study where animal protein digestibility is usually above 90%. So it's not a problem. For plant protein, uh, isolated protein have usually uh, relatively high uh, digestibility, close with, uh, above 95 or 85%. But as soon as there are other component, uh, cell walls, uh, uh, polyphenols, uh, tannins, and many components can reduce the digestibility of protein. That's why we say that uh, for whole grain, for instance, it's probably it's a very interesting uh, diet, uh, dietary source because there is many interesting components. But for protein, it usually reduces 
the digestibility of the protein. It can reduce the digestibility of the protein from plant, but when it is mixed with animal protein, well, it can also reduce uh, the digestibility. When we know that fibers, uh, a high uh, level of fibers in a, in a meal, reduce the digestibility of the protein in the meal. Okay, that's great, thanks. Um, I think we'll leave it for now. We come back later to the Q&A session where we can have more, uh, more discussion and we'll move on to the next um, talk. Also, uh, there's a comment or a question whether the presentations will be available. I believe they are. You can probably download them already somewhere, um, but we'll, we'll, we'll have that in a, in a minute. Um, so now I would like to welcome Dr. Chiara Nitride, um, who is a researcher in, in proteomics of food allergy at the University of Naples in, in Italy. And she will talk about analytical methodologies that are available for the analysis of uh, food-derived peptides and the gaps that still exist. And uh, Dr. Nitride has a, has a long experience working with food allergens, in particular with analytical methodologies for detection and quantification of, of allergens. And her talk is entitled The Digestome of Novel Proteins. What is it telling us? Please go ahead. So, hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for the nice introduction and thanks for having me here today. So, I think by now it's quite clear why we, the evaluation of novel protein um, and alternative sources of protein uh, was necessary and actually moved the research so far. So, this is my declaration of interest. So the word novel, when we use the word novel, we are actually referring to something that is new, something that is alternative, something that is not like what we are used. Uh, but when we talk about novel food proteins, we are not only referring to food that have been consumed to a limited extent, but we are also referring to food proteins that have been modified by innovative and alternative technologies, isolated proteins fraction thereof, and we are also um, referring to hydrolyzed. And so as a consumer, when we are purchasing something that is novel, a novel food that uh, we never, we were not used to have on our table, um, we start wondering, what is it going to, um, which are all the health benefits I'm going to gather from consuming this food? Um, is it going to be safe? Um, am I going to be able to digest it? And research is putting efforts in trying to answer this question and uh, uh, to try answering this question. Yeah, uh, sorry, I could not see the slides moving on. So nutrients to be able to be absorbed, they, go, they have to be broken down in small particles. And this is what actually happened when we eat food throughout our gastrointestinal digestive system. And we have ways to predict and simulate what happened in vivo using in vitro models. And these in vitro models mimic and simulate the oral digestion, the gastric digestion, as well as the duodenal digestion. These models are very well harmonized and validated, and they mimic, in this case, uh, the gastrointestinal digestive system of a healthy adult. There is a very last step of digestion, which is carried out by enzymes that are present on the brush burden membrane. And these enzymes are responsible for finalizing and breaking down the nutrients so that can be ready available. And when we think about proteins, these peptides are, we have uh, more than 20 peptidases. They actually release from oligopeptides and peptides, free amino acids, D and 3 peptides, which is what we are actually able to transport throughout the membrane. And this last step is not well harmonized yet. However, it's quite important as will give us information about the products of digestion. So the digestome itself, as we are actually digesting foods, we are digesting ingredients, is quite of a complex mixture of macromolecules and micromolecules. And the process we go through for preparing the sample for digest for analysis is quite complex. I'm not going to go into details and I'm more than happy to discuss it later on. What I would like to focus on is the way we do analyze the product of digestion. As we focus our interest on peptides, which are those uh, uh, products of digestion, which are more likely to have um, positive effect on the human health as well as detrimental effect. 
we use mass spectrometry analysis to collect the amino acid sequence of this peptide. And then what we use later on are software and databases of protein sequences to infer the peptide sequence to a protein or a protein family. And to try to simplify this concept, if we do imagine the digestome like a village, what we collect by mass spectrometry is the name of all the people living in the village of a certain age. And then what we do with the software is associate the name to a surname. So basically, we build slowly, slowly what we can imagine is the registry office of the village that can be the registry office of the digestome. So brush burden membrane enzymes. So as I said before, we have more than 20 peptidases and these enzymes uh, break down and reduce peptides to free amino acids that can be absorbed. However, so what we would expect is that by analyzing our peptides, we would see a reduction in the number of detectable peptides after the action of these enzymes. However, this is not always the case, and we have exception. And one example are roasted almonds, where the heat treatment produce aggregated proteins that are not digestible, and where actually the brush burden membrane enzymes acted releasing from these um, aggregated proteins uh, peptide among which also epitopic sequences. So their role is quite important and it's important to have a look at the way they behave to really fully understand which are the product of the digestion. So moving to a practical example of another source of protein, an alternative source of protein, this is an assessment of the digestibility and the digestion products of protein isolated from hemp seeds. So the 65% of the protein is represented by a globular-like protein, which is called the dastin, and this name word comes from the Greek word the dastos, which means edible. And the digestibility coefficient of this protein is 80%, which is pretty in line with what also Professor Tomei explained before for vegetable proteins. So we look at the products of digestion and we could detect a limited amount of peptides and among which none of the peptides belong to the adastin, which is the most abundant protein. And re this reflect in the high digestibility of the protein. As well as we were capable of detecting free amino acids, uh, abundant number of free amino acids and uh, essential amino acids. So these amino acids are bioavailable and they actually reach our gut and are ready for absorption. So since by mass spectrometry, we collect peptide sequences, so we have actually the sequence of the peptide that reach the gut, we can start looking for Peptide that may have a positive effect on human health, so bioactive peptides. And we um, identify in this mixture um, precursor peptide carrying three amino acids that may have a potential angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitory activity as well as antioxidant activity. And this is a molecular evidence of the presence of this peptide, this bioactive peptide, in the lumen and um, is uh, very much in line with cellular assay that actually demonstrated this activity for this protein. But who are those peptides that survive the digestion and that we found? So none of those peptides could be unfair to any of the protein sequences that are available for hemp. And this is quite of a big limitation that we have for novel food, but we also experience with food that are most more commonly consumed. So we have a very big lack of curated protein and genomic sequences, and this challenge and impair a proper characterization of the food. However, uh, by mass spectrometry, we can de novo sequence peptides. And this allow us to do something that is called identification biomology. So we can use as background protein, uh, databases of related organisms. And this allowed to identify several of these peptides using as protein, data, uh, protein background wheat and barley. And uh, several of these peptides surviving the digestion 
were inferred to uh, proteins belonging to the serpent superfamily. Now, serpents are proteins that are ubiquitous, they are present everywhere. But um, for wheat, they are recognized allergenic proteins. And what we can uh, provide by mass spectrometry is the evidence of the presence of protein in our proteome, which we would not have known otherwise. So it's quite of an important uh, added value. So just to sum up, the implementation of the digestion model with brush bird and membrane enzyme requires further development, but it is necessary to investigate the products of digestion that are likely to be absorbed. The mass spectrometry analysis of the digestion can provide peptide sequence information, which are really useful to learn about potential positive and negative effect that this peptide may have on human health. And the lack of completed and curated proteomic and genomic database is a limitation in the novel protein field, and peptide sequence information collected by mass spectrometry may help filling the gap, providing actually the evidence of the protein expression in our food. So thanks for thanks for the attention. And yeah, thank you, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mitridis, for the for the clear presentation, um, highlighting the the opportunities and, and challenges of these methodologies. Um, we do have uh, time for maybe a couple of questions, and they they keep coming in. And thanks for my healthy colleagues who. Hopefully, some of the questions from the chat to the Q&A, so just um, for the participants, if possible, choose the Q&A window. There are the three little dots on the left. You can uh, find it there. But um, so let's um, deal with a couple of questions. Um, I'll publish this one. Hopefully, um, it can be seen. So it's uh, it's around polypeptides, uh, so longer than tripeptides, and whether these can be absorbed in the gut particularly when they have a strong peptide bond, and whether there is any methodology um, to assess this. Sorry, uh, so when we talk about polypeptides, so we are talking about very long amino acid sequences that uh, mass spectrometry may not be capable of analyzing, even though there are ways of going around this problem, as um, uh, there are technologies that are capable of providing sequences with a lower accuracy, even of uh, uh, longer peptide that have are in pairs, so they don't really ionize well, which is the biggest problem with them by analyzing mass spectrometry. But what we do is to use, alongside the analysis of mass spectrometry, we use electrophoresis. So we do analyze the product of digestion by electrophoresis, and uh, this helps us collecting information and see whether there are higher molecular weight fragments. It is the way we actually identify aggregated proteins um, in the almond, roasted almond, which survived the digestion. And when we can still analyze those and see who they are by um, um, analyzing the gel bands, basically, by mass spectrometry afterwards. So we can collect this information. And whether these are going to have a role in the um, uh, uh, um, in a positive role on the human health or a negative role, uh, it is not something we can answer by mass spectrometry. In that case, we will need cellular assay to see whether they can be transported throughout the, the, the membrane or not. Okay, yeah, thanks. Uh, you were just breaking off here at the end, but I think we, we uh, got sorry. all the <laughs> answers, so thank you very much. Um, no, no problem. Yeah, so we'll, we'll um, uh, you know, keep some of the other questions uh, for, the, for the end of the session. Um, and we will now move on to the last presentation, which is a um, shorter presentation by Dr. Matt Florakis, um, who is a scientific project manager at ILSI Europe. And he's actually one of the driving forces behind ILSI's activities in the um, sustainability pillar, as we call it. And he will introduce the uh, formation of a new task force, which focuses on the consumer. Um, and it's called the Consumer Sustainable Food Choices or SEEDS Task Force. Um, Matt, please go ahead.
I think you're still on mute, Matt. I don't know. Is it still? It should be working now. Yes. Okay. So uh, I was just mentioning that. Uh, uh, thank you, Oliver, for the uh, for the nice introduction. And yes, I'm uh, very happy to introduce the new uh, Consumer Sustainable Food Choices uh, Seeds Task Force. It's a task force that we just created, and it's the first task force of the sustainability pillar. But before we uh, jump into the objective of the task force, I just want to give you some key numbers uh, that you may or may not be aware of. So August 22nd. August 22nd is the 2020 overshoot day, which means that on August 22nd, we spend and we consume all what Earth can actually provide us. And now we are 7 billion people. So this is expected to be worse by 2030 and 2050, where we expect to have 10 billion humans on Earth. So this overshoot day will be earlier and earlier in, in the year. This is the basis of the sust sustainable development goals from the UN, uh, where they basically try to create this uh, more sustainable environment for, for health and the planet. Not only we are consuming too much, but we, the way we're producing food is not right for the planet. So for instance, a third, a third of all carbon emissions come for the food production. Not only the carbon emission and the effect on the atmosphere, but also, for instance, 70%, 70% of all the water, of the fresh water used, is for the food production. So we must move forward a fair and healthy and environmentally friendly food systems. And in Europe, as Karen mentioned in the keynote, there's a strong push from the European Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy to move towards these uh, fair and healthy and sustainable food systems. So there's actually a lot of research already uh, mentioning what we should eat for our health, but also for the health planet. But as consumers, we usually face this very daunting task of selecting what we should buy to be able to uh, have healthy nutrition, but also something that is healthy for the planet. So we have this great dilemma as consumers uh, we are facing. And I think my computer is lagging, so just give me a second to switch the slide. So yes, the, the, the consumers, we need to be empowered to make informed and healthy and sustainable food choices. This is where the, uh, the ELC Seeds Task Force come in, where we want to create an environment favoring sustainable and healthy food choices. The main goal of this activity and this task force is to empower consumers to make healthy and sustainable food choices. And we also want to provide concrete pathways for the food industry to cater sustainable and healthy uh, food choices. The way we develop this task force is using uh, a classical European project structure with different work packages. So the first uh, work package is to establish a science-based foundation for front of pike labeling, combining health and sustainable and sustainability information. But, uh, and this uh, will, we will then develop in work package to a, uh, a front of pike labeling using design thinking. But we wanna go beyond uh, this front of pike labeling. And in work package three, we wanna create an environment favoring green and healthy food choices. And chaperoning all these uh, three work packages, we have a work package four geared towards stakeholder engagement and communication. This is critical to be able to increase the impact of our research and ensure high adoption rate uh, of this, um, of this uh, front of bike labeling and also this environmental, this environment we are creating. So here on the right side, you can see all the deliverables we wanna, we wanna uh, achieve with these uh, activities. So there are uh, at least four or five scientific publications. We have a lot of engagement with our stakeholders. We also wanna create educational material, and this is more for the environment we are trying to create and educate consumers to, make the, to be able to make these uh, food choices. So, um, 
if you wanna, if you have additional questions or if you wanna learn more about this uh, this topic, I will be more than happy to answer any of the questions uh, here. Or you can also uh, be in touch with me in the e booth. Uh, do not hesitate to navigate through the platform, uh, and we'll be happy to get uh, to answer any of your questions. Thank you. And Oliver, if you're back. Oliver, <laughs> you're surprised how short it was, right? <laughs> Thank you. Thank you much. Is um, yeah, I think I um, you can hear me back now. So thanks a lot, Matt, um, for yeah introducing this exciting and also ambitious program here. Um, as Matt said, you know I would like to invite every participant, interested companies, academics to use the opportunity of of today to connect with with Matt and Isabel um, or also following this symposium to learn more about the topics, uh, the contents, and maybe how you want to uh, or can get involved uh, with it. So we'll we'll now move on, uh, into the Q&A session. Uh, I would like to invite um, uh, my colleagues, Professor Tome, Dr. Nitride, to come on as well. We'll see how, how that works. And then um, look at some of the questions that I will that I will publish um, and maybe we'll start on a, on the topics that um, Professor Tome was um, talking about and let me maybe start with the questions around protein requirements so Professor Tome there there's a question around um, how the the quality scores can be extrapolated to athletes and elderly. Um, uh, you've shown the um, amino acid requirements for adults in general, but obviously there are subgroups, and, and um, so it's a question around these subgroups of adults who may need, um, you know, specific or higher requirements. Okay, so we we have to know that we have not so many data uh, on protein and particularly amino acid requirements in different populations. Most of the data are uh, uh, provided from experiment in a young adult uh, on which we have different methods. Uh, now usually uh, the uh, stable isotope uh, uh, amino acid oxidation method which are relatively recognized are the reference method but uh, we are not the, the results that we are have not so, are not so robust huh? and usually we consider that it is a, not really very quantitative uh, result that we have for amino acid requirement even for adults huh? we have absolutely no direct measurement for instance in infant very very few uh, measurement in the older subject now there are some results which are coming but as you know it's very difficult uh, to interpret for uh, older people because usually uh, they can be sick uh, they, are, they have many other problems that only uh, the age and so we are not sure that what we observe is not due for instance to uh, some illness and, and so on. And so until now, it is very controversial for both protein requirement and amino acid requirement that we should have a specific uh, value for our older subject uh, compared to, to younger subject. Uh, so that, that's the problem. So the, the value uh, are relatively robust for protein requirement in adults, hein, the 0.66 gram. I think if we agree that the nitrogen balance is a good biomarker, and personally I think it's a good bio biomarker, but it can be discussed, huh? we, we could look over biomarker in the future, that's what we do. So we can say we have relatively robust value for protein requirement in a young adult. We have experimental value for amino acid requirement in a young adult, but the value are not so precise, it's coming, it's coming now, but it's not so. And for, let's say for our population, we have no uh, really uh, clear experimental data. That's the problem. And so for instance, for infant, we use the factorial approach. Uh, we use the maintenance requirement obtained for adults. And then 
we had a growth component that is calculated for the growth and the uh, protein deposition uh, in genome. Okay, very good. Um, we have a, another question that I'll, I'll show here, which is maybe related in, in that, and that's about um, uh, vegan diets specifically in the context of, of the needs of infants and young children, um, because more and more consumers are making that choice. And, and you know, is that is that sufficient? And, and what kind of research can they um, can we do in this area? So, I, I, as I have shown uh, in my presentation, um, for adult, uh, vegan diet can be used, but as you can see, it's close to uh, induce limiting amino acid uh, situation. But if we use relatively good quality protein, if we probably um, uh, use more efficiently the biodiversity. And uh, there is a lot of study now when we are involved in different programs, then for, for the different crops, we try to optimize the amino acid uh, pattern in the diet. And we know, uh, we, we could observe that uh, even for uh, the same uh, plant, uh, if we, the, the bio, the bio, using the biodiversity, can provide some variety with higher protein content and uh, higher uh, amino acid pattern, particularly for the limiting amino acid like uh, lysine and sulfur amino acid. But uh, I cannot guarantee it can be exactly the same as when there is an uh, adequate proportion of animal. So for infant, uh, I think it probably a, mean con a real concern. As you have seen, for instance, even if we mix 50% soy, which is one of the best protein sources uh, from plant origin, and 50% rice, which is a very good source for sulfur amino acid, then we cannot meet 100% uh, quality according to our criteria, but I believe our criteria are not so bad. And the, the amino acid reference pattern that we use are not so bad uh, I, I, I don't believe they are overestimated. So I, I think in the future, uh, it's probably a concern and we have to look more precisely at the quality of the uh, protein source which are provided to the children. As I have shown from the uh, data uh, from FAO, uh, uh, in the population with uh, the main part of the food are coming for cereal and roots, the stunting uh, prevalency, prevalency is higher. And it's not always a problem of quantity. It's probably a problem of quality. And we have different programs in different parts of the world where we can see that uh, lysine and sulfur amino acid can be limiting and it's a concern for infants. To my opinion, it's a concern. And even in developed countries, we have to take care of this. Thank you. Thank you very much. I think this uh, this is definitely a very important um, yeah. topic and and um, something we need to to study more to really make sure that uh, it's adequate um, amino acid um, provision for for mm -hmm. the for the youngers and the infants uh, in the, in in moving to plant based sources. Oh, oh, fortification okay. so with we'll, amino we'll acid. Have, um, So we'll we'll do um, a, a couple of, another topic on on the protein side uh, and digestibility uh, relating food processing. Uh, there's a couple of themes coming. Um, I, I just show one question, but there's a couple of others, and uh, it's relating to the influence of food processing uh, on the digestibility of of proteins. In in this case, it's a uh, more specific around extrusion processes that are applied to, to meal replacers, meat replacers, so, you know, um, plant burgers and so forth. Um, yes. Uh, are you aware of any systematic studies that have looked at that? <laughs> yeah, there are many studies on the influence of food processing on protein quality and protein digestibility. And it can, according to the 
level or the intensity of the of the treatment it can either decrease or increase but actually we know that uh, relatively mild in, in treatment usually improve protein uh, digestibility um, that uh, uh, the, the accessibility of digestive en enzyme is easier because the, the protein structure are destroyed and then the, the digestion is uh, is improved and it is very well known and uh, uh, relatively mild heat treatment increase the digestibility after uh, with some treatment we know that it, it can for instance destroy some amino acids which are very sensitive like particularly lysine and silver amino acid we know that the the, the the amine group of lysine is very sensitive to reaction with, uh, with, with, with sugar uh, and can be in very many components and also the sulfur uh, group uh, in sulfur amino acid is also very active, sensitive to oxidation and so on. So according to the treatment, uh, it can increase or decrease. But really, when we cook uh, the food, usually it improves the digestibility. Okay, um, and maybe one, one more question on, on your part here, uh, which probably fits to something that we're talking about later today as well, and that's a question around the contribution of the microbiome to the production of indispensable amino acids under, let's say, a healthy diet. Ah, it's a very old story. Uh, I remember we, we, we discuss uh, this a lot. Uh, with Vernon Young and our colleagues, uh, which uh, unfortunately are not more not here anymore, um, it seems that the contribution, even in the uh, usual uh, situation, the contribution of uh, amino acid produced by the microbiome is not quantitatively recycled uh, to the host. Um, what we did, we, we did some labeling of the, it's very difficult to study, uh, as, as we imagine. Uh, we know that the microbiome produce many amino acids, uh, synthetized, uh, including lysine. And so what we did is we, we, we label the uh, amine group of lysine produced uh, by the microbiome. We could find some labeled lysine that was recycled but at a very low level. And uh, it cannot, it, according to the calculation that we need, it cannot contribute uh, to provide a quantitative uh, quantity of uh, lysine to the host. And it is also demonstrated that we can, by decreasing lysine in the food, we can have a lysine insufficiency to the host. That means uh, and it is the case for, for many components. We, we have the same problem, uh, for instance, with uh, vitamin K. Huh? Uh, there is a lot of menaquinone produced uh, by the gut microbiota. But if we uh, provide a vitamin K uh, deficient diet, then there is a vitamin K deficiency. And so we also consider, as for uh, amino acid, that they cannot contribute to uh, provide uh, the, these indispensable uh, nutrients uh, to the earth. It's a, it's a very fascinating question because why we have for amino acid, for vitamin K, for other vitamin also, a, a very uh, large quantity which is available in the large intestine and it is not recycled. Maybe in some very deficient situation, it could be in it, the, the amino acid or, or even vitamin K transport system. Because the problem is that the, the transporters are not expressed in the large intestine, for right, for amino acid. And so uh, that's why. But maybe in some in some very deficient situation, this transporter could be then expressed. We did not observe this, but maybe uh, it, we could imagine, or maybe we could try to induce this recycling. Uh, the only uh, way it is recycled is from the reflux from the large intestine to the ileum. Uh, in this case, in the ileum, for instance, the amino acid transport are present, and a small part of the amino acid 
coming for the large density are recycled, but as I say, the quantity is very low. Okay, so I, I think yes, the question it's probably a rather rather small contribution that the microbiome makes in this context. Um, so maybe let's move on to the to the um, yeah the allergen question. I'm uh, showing a question here around um, that we have the methodologies for digestibility and allergenicity in the peptides that the uh, and Nitrida showed, but. You know what other models are there available to assess the safety of, of novel proteins beyond that um, uh, digestibility question um, and then maybe also from yeah. that on uh, you know relevance to clinical um, data right yeah so uh, one of one example of alternative way of assessing um, allergenicity of novel food can come from insects uh, where actually by using what is called immunoblotting, uh, basically we use uh, the sera of people who are allergic and uh, we can test for cross reactivity. And this is where it's coming, like the information we have that people who are allergic to crustacea, to shrimp, for example, may actually be, it's very likely that to be allerg allergic to insects. So this is a way of approaching the problem, looking at people who are allergic and see whether this novel food can pose a risk for them. On the other side, when we are actually introducing novel food in our diet and we see an increased number of people consuming that food, we can have something that we call the novel sensitization. So we can have novel allergens, something we don't know today, that uh, proteins that are allergic, but may become allergic in the future. We see an increasing prevalence, for example, now people allergic to legumes, and this was not the case 10 years ago. So um, in that case, we can uh, use in CDCO models. There is therefore different approaches that by assessing the structure of the protein, the sequence of the proteins against proteins which are known to be allergenic, we can start assuming and predicting. But the problem with this is that we have to rely on available protein sequences. So we have to rely on what is available in the database. Basically, we need curated sequence of proteins to be able to assess in silico their potential allergenicity. And this is also a limitation because as I said before, one of the problems with novel food is the lack of protein sequences. So I think we need to put a little bit of more effort to try to collect this information to be able to answer the question of the novel sensitization. Okay, yeah, thanks. And I think there was also a comment uh, agreeing with you that the, the importance of bioinformatics and history of safety is, is, um, is important yes. in this context. Yes, um, I, I see now from the, um, from the little um, line at the bottom, we are, we are overdue. I, we have to to cut it short which is, is which is a bit unfortunate but um also there w were a couple of questions for matt but maybe with the e-booth um that can be done there so i i would like to to close the session i would like again to thank the speakers um dr fabri professor tome dr nitride um, dr florakis for for the great presentations for the for the discussion uh, i would like to thank every participant for um for your interest, for the questions, I know we left uh, quite a few uh, unanswered, um, but that's that's the way it is. There is probably opportunity to connect. And with this, I think I will I'll hand over to the to the lobby and Isabel. And I, I assume there is maybe cookies and coffee, uh, but I'm not sure uh, how that works. <laughs>